Hi, I'm Tom Stevenson, and I'm a professor of construction management. Today, we're going to be looking at understanding construction drawings for housing and small buildings. And we're going to be looking in particular at wall section details. We're going to be going into the different components and parts in typical wall details. And we'll be comparing between a wall detail with siding and one with brick veneer or a brick facade on it. So let's dive in. So I have these. Uh, wall section details and these are actually done uh, by Toronto Area Chief Building Officials Committee. Uh, they're based on National Building Code of Canada Standards and Ontario which is derived then Ontario Building Code uh, Standards and they're pretty typical though for uh, North American housing so it doesn't really matter US Canada. There will be obviously some minor uh, code differences by geographical area, but how it's structured and how you read and interpret the information is very similar. And so what I've got is these two wall sections and I'm going to zoom in on them. So if, you're, if your screen's a little bit small and you can't really see too much, I'm gonna zoom in on them in a minute. Uh, but the one here on the right is a brick veneer and the one on the left is siding. So you can kind of look at the difference here and it really the difference is coming in, you can hone in on it, on the location of where the, where the sill plates are located. And the sill plates are what tie the foundation wall um, to the framework. Uh, so really the sill plate here is on the outside of the foundation wall and here it's on towards the inside of the foundation wall. You have to leave enough space for the brick to actually sit on the foundation wall. But let's go right to the beginning and we'll take a look at the, the details and I'll, I'll zoom in and you'll see what we're looking at. All right, so let's take a look first at the brick veneer. And so this is this shot here. I've just zoomed in so you can see it a little bit more clear. And if we look, start at the bottom and work our way up, that's not a bad way to look at things. We've looked at site plans to, in previous videos uh, to figure out how far or how deep you have to excavate on a property. By the way, if you are interested in this series and you're interested in learning more about construction management, construction engineering, uh, print reading, uh, site supervision, project management, Click subscribe, check out my playlists. I have playlists on a variety of different topics that take you from start to finish on those particular areas. This is video number 10 on understanding construction drawings. So if you go to the understanding construction drawings playlist, you can see things from the very beginning uh, rolling up. But today we're looking at uh, wall details, as I said. And so we have our footings and this has a hatching here. So these tack box details are actually very well done. Uh, and they can be downloaded off the web for free. So uh, what I'll do is I'll try to put a link in the description so you can uh, download them. Uh, so that's a, an easy thing to do. Uh, and we have our footings here. And so the footings are what's gonna carry the load and it's gonna distribute the load or the weight of the whole structure. That means both the live loads and the dead loads. So the live loads are things like snow loads on the roof over here. Uh, the uh, the uh, dead loads are the weight of the roof itself, the shingles and the brick and the walls and the floor. Live loads, another live load would be people in the house, furniture, things that are movable. Um, those are examples. So your your footings transfer all that weight to the ground. So they have to transfer that to undisturbed soil or if it's been engineered and designed, it has to have the bearing capacity, the ability to support that weight without sinking. Otherwise you end up with the Leaning Tower of Pisa, which uh, nobody really wants on their house, right? Might work for uh, Pisa, but it's not gonna work too well on your house. So we've got uh, our footings, they're carrying the foundation wall. Now these particular tack box details, they're showing like if you wanted to do it with block, you could do this, or you could do it with poured concrete. Uh, in uh, Toronto and neighboring areas like poured concrete is very popular for foundations. We still do do blocks, but it's more for additions on houses and that sort of thing. It's less so for a whole new house. You can do it, uh, but we typically do it with poured concrete uh, because it's quicker, it's a little bit cheaper, it's a little bit more uh, resistant to moisture ingress through the walls, etc. 
So here on the outside, we have weeping tile or drainage tile. And this, these have a bunch of serrations in them and that allows that any excess water that is gathering around the footing, you wanna get rid of it. So it'll, it'll flow into that tube. Usually it's got like a sock over it. it looks like this um, sort of covering, uh, depending jurisdiction, it might be black in color. It might be kind of a whitish in color. Uh, and what that does is it stops uh, soil from penetrating into the tile, uh, the drainage tile. It's really this long plastic corrugated tube with serrations and it allows the water to get in it. Once the water gets in it, then it fills, it can sort of build up a little bit. And then because it's level around the footings, it seeks its own exit point, which will tie it to generally the storm sewers that are running on the street. Get rid of that water excess from your basement you don't want it coming in your basement all right and so this is a typical wall uh, section for a wall that would be just damp proofed difference between damp proofing and waterproofing is damp proofing is when you don't have hydrostatic pressure present like if you excavate a hole and it fills up with water it means that you're above the water table uh, typically right if you excavate and you build a hole uh, you excavate a hole and you, it does get some water in it just after a rain or something that's just the water settling down in that spot big difference you know if you're close to a lake perhaps you're going to have a high water table which means you have to waterproof the foundation you have to do a lot of extra steps to make sure that uh, you are relieving that pressure and that water doesn't end up in your basement but most cases, again, it depends your jurisdiction, right? You might be in a jurisdiction with very high water tables. Uh, most cases, uh, we damp proof uh, our foundation wall. So we spray it with this, it's kind of like a tar coating, but there's lots of different products that qualify for that. And then we put on a drainage layer and that's this sort of little bubbled um, outline here. And so it will say bitumous damp proofing. That's that tar coating that I talked about. Uh, on minimum six mil parging on concrete block. If it's concrete block, you have to parge the wall, put a coating, so because of all the joints, you wanna make sure that that is a quarter inch thick and that's covering all of the joints. If it is a poured foundation wall, wherever the snap ties are that hold the formwork tight against the walls, um, they snap out and then those have to be filled uh, so that water doesn't find its way through um, where the snap ties are. Uh, so those are, those are some of the, the differences between a uh, poured concrete and a uh, brick, uh, sorry, block a foundation wall. That's why it says poured concrete walls to have tie holes filled with cement mortar or damp proofing. Um, so it's nice and clear, these uh, section details. You won't always get that much clarity, but it should be something similar to that in your detailed drawing. And the drainage layer is and it says minimum mineral fiber insulation i haven't seen anybody use that in years and years um, what's currently done is this free draining granular material just both of these meet code requirements so that's why they put both being uh, tacbock toronto area chief building officials they're putting the different options and the drainage layer material if any water gets through it quickly drops down and it comes out where the drainage tile is or the weeping tile, and then it's taken away. So the idea is you don't want a buildup of hydrostatic pressure against the wall. We want the water to get away from the foundation. Here we have our concrete slab. So it's on, and again, we've talked about uh, various hatchings, and these are hatchings. This is gravel. The nice thing about gravel, it looks like gravel, and concrete kind of looks like concrete. Uh, so that's the little dots and that's the little gravel because concrete's a mixture of fine aggregates and coarse aggregates bonded together with uh, Portland cement. Then here it's showing full height basement insulation. This is our current codes and they've done a really sort of extra job on here. They're showing styrofoam against the wall and then they've got fiberglass insulation. Uh, depending on you know how you want to approach it there's a lot of ways of insulating basements building science people would probably not be too thrilled with fiberglass in the basement and also sort of sandwiched between extruded polystyrene and a vapor barrier here uh, but uh, there's different choices we're always concerned about moisture ingress and basically this hatching here is representing the vapor barrier right which is resisting moisture from getting into the wall 
and condensing inside the wall, reaching the dew point. If the dew point is somewhere in here, it probably won't be a problem. So if it's been designed that the dew point is landing in here, shouldn't be a problem. But if the dew point is in here, any moisture that would get through would may condense and that can cause all kinds of mold and other issues. But definitely we do want to have our basements insulated and we do want to have uh, them uh, so that uh, we don't have a lot of air leakage going on. So this is actually uh, can be acting as the air and the vapor barrier on the inside of the wall here. Um, but again, there's a lot of nuances with building science on basements that we have to be a little bit cognizant of. Here we've got the sill plate that is attached to the foundation wall, as I mentioned earlier. So that's that hidden line. Remember the dashed lines when you're reading drawings? It means it's behind something. Well, this is inside the concrete. It's this half inch steel bar that is bent. It's threaded on the top and there's a nut and a washer that goes on and that tight attaches the sill plate to that. And the sill plate should be resting on a um, basically a foam layer so that it is not going to absorb moisture up through it, right? So that's the other thing. Uh, here it says provide continuous uh, air barrier between plate and foundation wall. So there's what we call a sill gasket. It's kind of this foam layer that doesn't like really sort of watertight foam layer that doesn't allow moisture to absorb through it because you have uh, over here, you have your grade level. There's another hatching for the ground and there's going to be moisture, right? And it may get into the foundation wall. Snow may pile up against that. And so it'll be absorbed into the concrete. Well, we don't want it to absorb up into the wood or into the brick. If it absorbs up into the brick, we get subfluorescence. So that's also why we've got this uh, flashing here, which is protruding outward. Uh, and the brick is a little bit cantilevered over because we do have issues with space. Very often our foundation walls are 200 millimeters, typical. They may be 250, that's another thickness, so 8 or 10 inches thick. And uh, we don't want, uh, we want to provide room for it. So that's with the brick. So you got the brick, you got to have an airspace between the brick and the wall. They're showing a rigid insulation board on the outside here, probably uh, 25 millimeters. It's kind of off the screen right now, so I think it probably is that. One inch, one inch thick. And we've got our bottom plate for the wall shown here. And then another hatching that's just showing bat insulation. It could be a Roxel product. Uh, it could be a fiberglass product. There's different types of bat insulation, but definitely bats just means it's kind of squeezable and it's friction fit and it fits in between the cavities of the studs. And of course, we've got another hatching here, which really shows the brick. Usually for a hatching for brick, it's not this clear where it shows mortar joints and everything. These are really nicely done. Usually just shows the slashed kind of lines going uh, down parallel to each other. Uh, which gives that indication. We've got our floor joist here. We've got a rim joist right here, which wraps around the edge of the floor joist. We maintain that one inch airspace. So if any moisture gets in, it will come out through the drainage holes or the wheat, uh, sorry, the um, weep holes that we ha leave spaces between the brick, usually every third brick along the base on top of the flashing. So any moisture that gets in can get out and it also provides an air current that will dry out the inside of the cavity uh, so that moisture doesn't end up being absorbed somehow through the wall. You know, you can put blue skin, you can put all kinds of, you know, Tyvek paper on the outside, just regular building paper uh, there. But if moisture gets in, good building science principles are that you have a way for it to get out, for it to dry out, because nothing is perfect. And so when you have built in certain redundancies, it protects uh, the building and the structure. That's why brick veneer is a really good design. Uh, very, very uh, durable product. You can look around uh, hundreds of years old houses, uh, 
brick's still in great condition, especially if it's got a pretty good roof overhang. Uh, the most vulnerable part is the chimneys. And in new housing today, we don't even have to put chimneys if we don't want to because we have high efficiency furnaces and we have direct vent fireplaces. So we can really have long lasting exterior walls if we design them properly. And this is part of our code requirements that way and why there is this airspace left between the brick and the siding, right? And so, yeah, and that's what it's referring to, provide weep holes at maximum 800 millimeters apart. Like I said, it's usually every third brick, but it depends on the size of the brick, right? All right, so that's sort of giving you an idea about what's going on on that part of the brick. Let's take a look at, so now we're just at the top part. So it's the same wall, right? This was the bottom part of the wall, and now I've just zoomed in that we can look at the top part of the wall. We talked about the location of the sill plate being pushed to the back. Uh, so that the floor can rest here. We're leaving enough space though that we can fit this insulation, this one inch airspace and our brick. We have, if we follow up the wall and you can see these are break lines. Remember we talked about line types, object lines. You can see they're slightly darker. Uh, hatching for styrofoam, brick, uh, fiberglass, uh, bad insulation. This is showing like it's bad insulation, but in all truth, it would be likely blown insulation in. Uh, to the attic. So that blown insulation, it's like you got, you could be fiberglass, cellulose, could even be recycled denim jeans I've seen. So there's lots of different products that can be blown in uh, for the attic, but it's usually blown in because it's easy to get a lot of depth and coverage at a reasonable cost. And so that's usually what's done. And with building code changes today, and perhaps in your state or province or wherever you happen to be, uh, we keep increasing the amount in the attics. There's a certain amount of diminishing return, but uh, every code renewal that I've seen in the last 25, 30 years has always increased the R value, the resistance to heat loss, uh, through wall systems and ceiling systems. And you do that by increasing insulation or it providing insulation like with styrofoam that reduces thermal bridging and has fairly high R values per inch because space is also a premium that we have to think about too. Uh, so that's the other thing that we struggle with in some cases. Uh, so these are saying RSI values. Again, you know, if you're in the US, you won't see RSI. I values. That's just the, the metric. It just the SI just means Systems International. Uh, so don't confuse that with R value. It's much, much higher when it's an R value. I have to do the conversion on that, but it's probably something like uh, showing. This might be a little bit older, this detail. So it might be showing uh, like R48 or something like that. Now I think our codes have gone up to around R60, um, which is pretty hefty amount of insulation. The other thing that we try to do too is we try to, this is showing like for a raftered roof, we try to use uh, raised heel roof trusses usually so that we don't compromise the insulation in this point, which means that this section is higher above here so that we can provide an airspace and it doesn't allow for less insulation. We try to keep that pretty high uh, in that section. So air would flow through here, this airspace. There's a vented soffit. This would help to dry that airspace out. We've got the weep holes in the bottom. We'd have weep holes over windows and doorways. And so there's good ventilation that would move through that wall because this is vented. That's the little serrations you see when you look up at the soffit. This is the soffit area. This is the fascia. This is your eaves trough. Uh, here and it talks about roof ventilation one to three hundred of the insulated ceiling area uniformly distributed so when it's talking about that it means that if you have 300 square feet of ceiling you have to have one square foot of ventilation if you have one square foot of ventilation half of that should be at your soffit and half of that should be up on your roof so that you have a nice flow of air because if any moisture laden air hits the dew point in your ceiling you want it to dry out. So you're building in redundancies that even though you put a uh, air vapor barrier right on the ceiling, which is your poly, and it has to be tightly sealed for the air barrier part. The vapor barrier part is that it doesn't basically permeate through um, the actual material. But you know what? It's like you can't make it perfect. And there will always be some points of moisture getting in there. You want it to dry out. Right? And only, even if you do the plastic over a number of years, it deteriorates. And so you want it to be able to dry out. 
and so air movement through here is if moisture gets in it's able to dry out good building science principles built in there um, so this is your typical uh, tack block detail also notice here the amount of distance from the grade to the brick it says 150 millimeters so that's six inches so six inches from grade. you can't have it less right building code says because we don't want it too close because if we get too close maybe you know somebody shovels up there maybe there's snow and salt uh, against the wall well the brick would absorb that salt and then as it dries out the salt is left behind on the front of the brick so if you've ever seen that white powdery stuff on brick walls and wondered what that is that's soluble salts when it happens up in a wall we call it efflorescence when it happens near the grade, because it's being absorbed from the ground, we call it subfluorescence. Well, if you get enough buildup of salt and freeze-thaw cycles in the winter, then eventually it will deteriorate the brick and it'll cause spalling and that sort of thing. It takes a while because brick is pr pretty resilient, but if you get enough of it, that's where you see the brick deteriorating and spalling off. And it's like, oh, that's too bad uh, from that perspective. So most of that can be prevented with those simple steps of having that flashing there, having enough space from the ground, not piling things up after the fact against the wall. Um, these are important things that are in the building code. And this is what you're looking at when you interpret a detail, a construction detail like this, right? And so again, it's cut through, we're looking inside the wall. We can see stuff like the, the subfloor material. We can see stuff like the rigid insulation, the styrofoam insulation. We can read exactly what that's, telling to us what it's saying to us and getting to know the nomenclature the terminology that's used like a fascia board a soffit vented means it's got little serrations and it allows air to flow up this is basically a baffle that uh, is put into place to ensure that air space is left there so the air can move up through into the attic um, typically this isn't put on every uh rafter or truss opening but it's put enough that it's going to meet that 50 percent roof ventilation requirement that you've got 50 percent ventilation coming from here and 50 50 percent ventilation up on the roof um, so those are important uh important factors as well this seal header wrap i think i'll leave this for another one seal header wrap to vapor barrier so this header wrap actually goes around the rim joist and down and the reason for that is the header wrap has to be a breathable material, like a Tyvek product. Tyvek is like uh, we wrap around our buildings with it. And I think of it like it's a Gore-Tex jacket, like a good ski coat. So in other words, it doesn't let water come in, but it does breathe. It does ventilate. So like a good ski coat does, you know, it doesn't let you know the snow and the the water come in really on on you so you don't feel wet but if you sweat it dries to the outside as opposed to if you wear a raincoat or you get a cheap ski coat that doesn't breathe you're sweating all the time and you're like why am i always sweating it's the coat it doesn't breathe and so in this case we want the outside to breathe and we want the inside to have a vapor barrier so we will have a header wrap wrapped around this ideally if this is being designed because you got styrofoam here styrofoam there you want to design this such that the actual dew point is occurring in here so it's not really condensing the moisture is out here and it's not condensing in there um, that's where you really run into problems uh, with that all right so that is the brick veneer here's the siding so i don't have to spend too much time because everything else is the same for the siding it's just the siding has to be a little bit further up, all right? So the brick is a little bit more resilient material to moisture. The siding is not, and depends on the siding what it is, but we really don't want this uh, insulation all getting sopping. Well, it's styrofoam, so it won't be too much of a problem. But if it was a wood siding, we definitely don't want that getting wet. And so we, building code-wise, we have to leave this up 200 millimeters instead of 150 millimeters, and we locate our sill plate towards the outside instead of having it located towards the inside. So you note the difference in location. You have to leave room for the brick and the airspace, right? 
And here, you just want to line it up with the outside so that you can have your siding hang out over a little bit and that it will drain. Now, different types of siding, like if you were using a wood siding, I would definitely want to make sure it was strapped because again, I would like to have it vented behind the siding uh, so that air would flow behind if it was a wood siding. If you're in some, some areas, that's kind of popular still. Uh, around Toronto, it's not really that popular. We're kind of a big into brick in the Toronto area, but every jurisdiction is different. Uh, my daughter lives in Buffalo, and when I cross into Buffalo, there's a lot of uh, this type of housing uh, going on uh, there. It's probably using mostly composite materials in new houses, but a lot of the existing housing stock is different that way um, for those um, particular reasons. So we can sort of get that comparison there uh, looking up here, this is all pretty much the same over here. Again, you just don't have the brick with the ventilation space there. And this vent is, ventilation is still venting out the roof at one to three, all building code requirements uh, there. Same idea with the header wrap that wraps around. So the header wrap allows any moisture that might get in to be able to breathe and to dry out. And then we've got our um, vapor barrier uh, on the inside here, right? This would be lined up on the inside here. Um, so that that would um, make that uh, resistant to vapor from getting in. So those are a comparison and that's the type of stuff you look at when you're looking at uh, details. So that's a pretty good look, I think, or quick look at a wall detail comparing siding and comparing brick, uh, brick veneer. They're solid masonry, older houses, probably solid masonry, not brick veneer. The other thing I should point out with the brick, this isn't carrying any weight. We frame the whole house and then we put the brick, right? So we frame the whole house and then we put the brick. It is a facade, very protective, weatherproof facade, but it is not structural. A solid masonry wall where you've got two whites of brick, this would be one white of brick. Uh, two whites would be two of them together or brick and block behind it without all this framing then that's a solid masonry wall and it's structural. But in this case, it's not structural. And this is typical because we want to be able to seal up our buildings and make sure that the envelope has a lot of insulation because, well, you know how expensive heating is, whether you're using solar, electricity, whatever it is, you know, it is uh, gas, um, oil, depending on your jurisdictions. Uh, it can be very, very expensive. So what do we try to do? We try to make the envelope higher R values, resistance to heat loss, and we try to seal it well that it our warm, moisture-laden air, warm is always moving to cold. It slows it down, right? Makes it more difficult for it to um, exit. So that's an important function of our envelope. Now, the other thing is if you're building really super tight houses, then you need, that's talking mechanical systems, we need like a HRV, heat recovery ventilator, or ERV, depending on what you're after exactly. That will transfer the stale air from inside and transfer the heat over to the nice fresh air coming in. So it, it ensures that the inside of the house has fresh air. So these are all things that we'll be talking about in future videos as we go along. If you enjoyed this video, uh, please click the subscribe button now. Click the notifications. You'll see new ones when they come up. And please take a look at my playlist. You click on my face over there and you should be able to see playlist. Look under the playlist and you'll see a lot of videos there. So I'm Tom Stevenson wishing you a wonderful day. And I'll put a, a link reference in the description to the textbook that I use uh, that I've written for understanding construction drawings if anybody's interested. But again, I'm Tom Stevenson wishing you a wonderful day and we'll see you next time. Bye for now.